Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Almost since the beginning of time, men have shaped society. From ancient times to madmen, patriarchy was the defining framework of our society. They dominated in industry as workers and leaders, in college graduation, in earnings, in national and local leadership, and in protecting our society. Women and girls were left behind. In the 70s and 80s, all of that began to change. Things like the feminist movement and Title IX in 1972 were both achievements and symbols of success and harbingers of important social changes. But none of this happened in a vacuum. Other social and political changes were taking place in the nature of work, of communications, of education, of character, and economics. Over time, not just as a zero-sum exercise, the world of boys and men changed. Some of the changes were obvious, and frankly, more men should have seen them coming. Others happened in a more subtle way, not unlike the frog in boiling water. Suffice it to say that today these changes have reshaped our society. The gender gap is reshaping our politics and feeding authoritarian populism. It impacts the raising of younger generations, and it all adds to the class, cultural, economic, political, and character divisions. And unfortunately, like almost everything else, it's become a talisman of the left-right polarization. Trying to raise the conversation about all of this is my guest, Richard V. Reeves. Richard Reeves is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, where he directs the Boys and Men Project. His research focuses on social mobility, inequality, and family change. He was previously a director of Demos and a principal policy advisor to the Minister of Welfare Reform in the UK. He is the author of the previous book, Dream Hoarders, and is a regular contributor to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Journal, and the Atlantic. His most recent work garnering national attention is of boys and men, why the modern male is struggling, why it matters, and what to do about it. Richard Reeves, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me back, Jeff. Well, it is indeed a delight to have you here. Certainly, this has been coming for a long time, this change in in the role of, of men in our society. Did the focus on girls and women that really began in the early 70s lead to this? Is this a question of a zero-sum game, or were there more, as you talk about in the book, far broader structural changes that led us to where we are today? Yeah. Well, it's important to get this right at, right at the front of the conversation, so I'm glad you've opened with that, which is it's not, it's not a zero-sum game. The rise of women in any of the areas that we might talk about, in education, the economy, uh, are, not, are not the cause of the decline of men. But I would say that the, the rise of women, especially in, in the economy, as a result of all the intentional efforts that you referred to in your intro, have created a new world. A completely transformed world, particularly in terms of the economic relation between women and men. And that's not something that we, I think, have fully come to terms with. And so during the decades when we were focusing quite rightly on the opportunities and outcomes for, for girls and women, we were neglecting the potential implications of some of those changes for boys and men, and indeed just some of the things that were happening to boys and men, regardless of those other changes, such as the industrialization the impact of male, of, uh, of globalization and automation on male employment and on male earnings, but then also just the way the education system has, has swung very strongly from being one where the outcomes favored boys and men to one where they very strongly favor girls and women, and that that mattering more and more in a, in a world where education does matter a lot more for your work. And so I think we just had our eye on one ball, but we now need to put our eye back on the other ball, if you like, which is like, what's what's happening over here with, with women, but then kind of what's happening over here with boys and men? That's been neglected. And that neglect has led to, I think, a, a number of problems, not least in our politics, because it's an axiom of politics that if there are real problems and responsible people don't address them, then irresponsible people will exploit them. And so some of that, I think, is what's playing out in our politics today. It's a, a failure to just look, look straightforwardly at some of these issues facing boys and men and tackling them. I want to talk first about the educational aspects, because certainly we see globalization, the change in the nature of work. Those things in many ways are obvious, and those are fundamental changes that have happened in the economy, both in the U.S. and, and globally. 
talk about what's different with respect to education, because on the surface, it seems that that our education, and, and this is both uh, good and bad, hasn't changed dramatically in the past 50, 60 years. What is it that has changed that has impacted men in education? Yeah, you're right. I mean, what's, it's remarkable, really, that without very significant change in the systems, we've seen gender gaps in one direction reverse and go in the other direction. And so to put a data point on it, in 1972, when Title IX was passed to promote women and girls in education, men were about 13 percentage points more likely to get a four-year college degree. And today it's 15 percentage points that women are more likely than men to get a college degree. So the gender gap in college education is wider today than it was in 1972. It's just flipped, it's reversed, uh, without the system particularly changing. And so what I think has happened is the the ways in which the system favor women and girls compared to boys and men has just become apparent as we've taken the artificial ceilings off the aspirations and opportunities of women and girls. And so the fact that the education system is a bit more female-friendly wasn't visible under conditions of patriarchy or sexism, but it's visible now because we have taken away most of the barriers that previously held women down. So to put it very bluntly, it didn't matter if girls were better in school if they weren't going to college, but now they are, and they're doing better at college as well. And so it's not so much that the system's changed, it's that the system already had some built-in, and we can talk about, perhaps can talk about some of these, built-in ways in which it tended to favor girls and women, but we, those were invisible under conditions of sexism. Talk about some of those ways in, in which it, it really has favored girls and women. So I think there are a few ways in which the school system, the education system generally, tends to be somewhat more female-friendly than male-friendly. The first is that the kinds of skills that are rewarded, especially in the crucial years, the high school years and beyond, are those that on average are found more likely to be found in girls than boys. Paying attention, sitting still, deferring gratification, future orientation, etc. There, are, there are just some differences on average between boys and girls um, that are favored in a system that rewards that kind of behavior. The second thing is that those skills, sometimes they're called non-cognitive skills. So it's not about being smarter. It's about having your act together. It's about being more organized. Uh, is that those skills develop earlier in girls. So they're not only more advanced in girls generally, but they develop earlier, partly because girls hit puberty earlier. And so at around the age of 15, 16, the brains of girls in that crucial prefrontal cortex are about a year ahead of boys. And the prefrontal cortex is the bit of the brain that is the bit that says turn in your chemistry homework rather than go to the party. It is the bit that remembers you have chemistry homework. And it is the bit that focuses on your GPA. So that's, that's number one. It's just that neurologically, there are some advantages to girls in the education system. The second thing is that the teaching profession is becoming progressively more female. So only 24% of K-12 teachers now are men. In elementary, it's only one in 10. And there's some evidence that actually boys do benefit from having some male teachers around, especially in subjects where they're traditionally weak, such as English. In just the same way, by the way, that girls seem to benefit from having female teachers in areas where they have been traditionally weak, such as science and math. And so there's a, the, the steady feminization of the teaching profession is also, I think, an important factor. And the third is there's been an increasing emphasis on what you might think of as book learning or academic learning, as opposed to vocational styles of learning, applied learning styles, and a and really an underinvestment in more vocational forms of training and everything else equal. It's quite clear that boys tend to benefit more from more of a hands-on learning style than girls do. So for those three reasons, if you like brain, brain science, the gender of the teachers in front of the classroom, and the nature of the teaching, all three of those point towards a somewhat more female-friendly school system. This has been going on for some time. This trend is not something that happened just overnight. Why has there not been more attention paid to it? Why have we not heard more from public intellectuals, from role models, even, dare I say, from politicians occasionally about this issue, which has been like an oncoming train for a long time. Well, I want to be fair to, to the people who have been in, in this space. So, I, you know, I think it would, would be remiss of me not to mention books like The Boy Crisis from Warren Farrell and John Gray and The End of Men from Hannah Rosen. 
So there, there have been, there have definitely been attempts to raise this issue. But I think you're broadly right that there's been a reluctance to engage with it. And I think one reason is that these trends have just been growing and growing, as you say, for a while. I think you use the analogy of a frog in water in your intro, Jeff. And I, I do think that it, because it doesn't take the form of a sort of immediate crisis, instead these are sort of just steadily worsening trends in many cases, it's harder perhaps for people to pay attention to it. But I think the bigger reason is that it's only very recently that it's made any sense at all to talk about the problems of boys and men generally, because there's been so much to do for women and girls. And I think when something changes that quickly, it's hard for everybody to update their priors. And that means, relatedly, that there are lots of institutions and organizations whose job it is to highlight the problems that are faced by women and girls, any number of non-profits, non-coalition government agencies, etc. And they do a pretty good job, by and large, of drawing attention to any issues that are being faced by girls and women. But there are not the equivalent organizations or institutions for boys and men for obvious and good reasons, right? But many of those organizations were formed in the 70s and 80s during the, so that high tide of them really moving towards women and girls. And so there, there aren't really institutions whose job it is to highlight it. And then lastly, you mentioned politicians. There's some risk uh, right now. The way this debate is framed as a zero sum, as we were talking about earlier, is that any, any politician who raises this issue is going to run the risk of being seen as in somehow less committed to the cause of women and girls. And that creates a vicious circle because it means the only ones who will are the ones who are less committed to the, to the problems of women and girls. And so then the binary just um, deepens. And I think that's one of the things that's really driving some of the polarization we see right now uh, in our politics is, is how the different sides approach the issues of gender. It, well, in part, it's because the issues have become not only politicized, but weaponized by one side. I would say by both sides, yeah. I mean, I think that it's fair to, in different ways, but in very different ways. Um, so I, I think the, the right, I mean, Josh Hawley has his own book coming out next year called Manhood, Re- Rediscovering the Traditional Male Masculine Virtues. Um, and there is there are some on the right, who I think are leaning into a sort of discontent and turning male problems into male grievances and essentially asserting the need to turn back the clock in one way or another and either explicitly or implicitly blaming feminism and the women's rights movement for the problems of men, which falls into that zero-sum trap. But on the left, there has been a real push towards sort of talking about toxic masculinity and insisting that we live in such a strong patriarchy that it makes no sense at all even to talk about boys and men. So in different ways, I think that that has been driving both. But you're right, the both, there's a weaponization of it. And what that leaves is pretty much everybody else. Like most ordinary people want their sons and daughters to flourish. They are worried about both in different ways. Many moms are very, very much worried about their sons, even though they might themselves be card-carrying feminists. They still worry about their boys and they see the trends and are really worrying about them. And so most ordinary people are perfectly capable of holding two thoughts in their head at once. But the politicians are digging in and fearing that if they give an inch to the other side, that that will that that means that they'll take a mile. And I, in some ways, what I'm trying to do with my work in this space is make this more of an ordinary problem. Right? There are some problems here, big problems uh, in employment, in healthcare, and education that are specific to boys and men. And we should we should tackle them appropriately. So in some ways, some, in some ways, some of the nicest things that have been said about my book are, are that it's earnest, bordering on banal. I think that was Matthew Iglesias. And there is a sense of it's you know policy wonky and 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 very very facts driven and so on. I honestly think that's what this debate needs right now. It's just a more grounded and a more ordinary conversation about it, away from the the heat of the culture war. Do men have to take more responsibility in facing up to these changes that have taken place? I I suppose first acknowledging that the changes have taken place, understanding what some of the structural underpinnings are that we've been talking about, and realizing that change has to happen, that things are never going back to the way they were in, in 1950. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think part of the recognition is that there isn't an easy way out here. I think that there's an understandable nostalgia for a world where things were not only easier for men, but in many ways better for men. Uh, I say I do think it's understandable because this is a difficult adaptation, but it is absolutely incumbent on men at an individual level as well as a collective one to adapt to the world as it is, a world of gender equality. And again, most men actually welcome that in their own lives. 
But what they also want is to have their own opportunities uh, and their own role and place in society and in the family. And so then the question becomes, what are the structures around them and are those supportive of them? And so I agree that there is a need for men to to adapt, to face the facts of the world as it is, rather than allowing themselves to be led into a sort of nostalgic dream for the world as it used to be. But on the other hand, I think we, we as policymakers, mainstream society, government, et cetera, the broader society has to look at the structural challenges facing boys and men, including in places like the education system and the labor market, which has really destroyed a lot of men's jobs. And so that we don't place all of the responsibility on the shoulders of individual men. I think that would be a mistake. Certainly there's historical precedent for the fact that when equality comes to anything, the side that is losing their their prior position on top is never going to be happy about it. Yeah. In fact, that's almost a direct paraphrase of something one of my colleagues, Dana Bowen Matthew, once said, which is equality always feels like a loss to the people who are previously unfairly ahead. And she was talking about it in the context of race, but I think it equally applies here too, which is, I think we have to be honest about the fact that it is in some ways a tougher adaptation. Like for women, it's a tough adaptation for many women in some ways, but at least like they're adapting to a world where they have more power, more choice, more responsibility, more agency, right? more, more autonomy. And so that's obviously good by and large. Um, but for men, it's less obviously good. I think it is good because they will get more choice, including how to be fathered and so on too. But the loss of relative status that men are feeling, I think, is part of the story here. And I don't think there's any of avoiding that fact. That makes it a tougher transition for men. And we have to work harder to help men make that transition, to help them see the positives, to support the positives, and to throw real resources at helping men in this new world, helping men to adjust. I, I'm a little bit afraid that right now that the, the position of many is to say, yep, this is going to be difficult for men, um, and then to stand with their arms folded, watching them fail. And given how difficult it's going to be for men, that surely makes it even more important that we offer them more help rather than just leaving them to it. The broader underpinning of all of this goes to something you certainly have written a lot about in the past, which is class divide in America. Talk about that. Yeah, I think it's incredibly important to look at this through a class lens, because whilst it's true that most American men today earn less than most American men did in 1979, which is in itself an important economic fact, that's not true of men at the top. Men at the top earn more than men at the top did in 1979. And so all of this is happening against a backdrop of rising economic inequality and growing class inequality and class stratification. And what that means is that for the men at the top, top of the economic pile, the educational pile, we are mostly doing okay. And we have the resources to adapt to a world of greater equality with much greater ease than men who have less economic power than us. And one of the problems, and of course, there are many parts of society right at the top where it's still male-dominated, politics, the boardroom, etc. And so there's a danger that it's hard even to get people to take the problems of boys and men seriously if they're only looking around their upper middle class environment they look around their their world and say well i don't see that many men struggling in fact i see a lot of men still on top that's true but not if you look down and so we might be leaning in to use (laughs) Cheryl Sattberg's phrase but not looking down and and it's a very very different world once you start to look down um because both men and women at the top are flourishing in many ways and leaving behind a lot of men a lot of women and men lower down. And in fact, the gender gaps on most measures, including things like education, get much, much wider at the bottom. And so it is working class men and black boys and men, especially that I'm most concerned about and that I think we should be most concerned about. Because the problem breaks down along such class lines, it seems that it makes it a lot harder to solve and a lot harder to address because the problems and the themes are not universal. It's true that many of the problems and themes are not universal. So we just talked about the ways in which upper middle class men have been largely insulated uh, from these shocks, but they are widespread. And so it's important, I think, not to mistake the fact that just because men at the top aren't struggling from these uh, economic and social and educational challenges doesn't mean that most, most men are or a significant share of men are. So you're right that we have to look at it through 
a more specific lens than just all men. And many of the things that I'm interested in in proposing uh, or pursuing will actually be of much greater benefit to men who are lower down the socioeconomic ladder. So, for example, one of my proposals is to create a thousand new technical high schools across the country and invest much more in apprenticeships. Everything else equal, that is going to, as things stand, going to help more men from working class backgrounds rather than men from upper middle class backgrounds. That's a good thing. That should be seen as a feature of it, uh, not a bug. And, and I think there are other ways in which we could think about targeting some of the help that I'm interested in to those men who are most affected by it. A, a colleague of mine privately said, well, you know, we have like a displaced worker program. We need like a displaced men program, which is to look at the men who in particular have been affected by the economic trends of recent years and target some of our uh, help towards them. And then when we do do it to make to make it clear that's what we're doing. And so even though the infrastructure bill was not passed in order to help working class men, it will help working class men. 70% of the jobs that are created will go to men, largely working class men, of, and probably black and Hispanic men disproportionately. So I would, if, if I was the person selling the infrastructure bill, I would be making that a clear part of the sell, which is this is going to help working class men because working class men are the ones who in economic terms have had the toughest ride of it over the last few decades. Do we have an additional problem because family formation today seems to be so much more aggressively along class lines? Yeah, so marriage rates and family stability are high uh, among the upper, and upper middle class. College educated Americans are marrying, as we've talked about this before, I think, in the same, you know, very similar rates to their parents and staying married actually a little bit more than their parents. But 40% of children are now born outside marriage. And for those mothers without a college degree, without a four-year college degree, again, the majority of children are born outside marriage. And that's a, that's a significant increase. Uh, uh, that 40% figure for the whole population is up from 10% only a few decades ago. And so what you're seeing is a complete reshaping of family life uh, away from the presumption of marriage. And marriage, in, in turn, was based on the presumption of the economic dependency of women on men. And so what we're seeing is an unbundling of, of, of the traditional family form, which we can see in all kinds of ways, but you can particularly see it in the rise of non-marital childbirth and the rise of single parents. So that means we need new models of fatherhood and motherhood and new approaches to public policy. We're not going to get back the old style of marriage, even if we wanted it. And so what that means is that for men who are struggling economically, in, low, in the lower socioeconomic rungs of the ladder, they then might also be struggling in terms of family life because it's harder for them to fulfill the traditional breadwinner role that is still to some extent valorized in those working class communities. So those men in some ways face a double whammy. They've lost economic power, but as a result of that, they've also lost social status and family status, which in turn makes them less incentivized in the economy. And so it becomes a vicious circle. And we're seeing less and less cross-class marriage as well. Yeah, that seems to be true because uh, the rise in, of course, the number of college-educated women means that you can now marry within class uh, in a way that you couldn't before. Because uh, so this is this is one of the fruits of the women's movement is that there are, you know, there are now a lot of college-educated uh, women for college-educated men to marry. And in fact, we've just crossed an interesting line, uh, which is that in most American marriages now, the wife is more educated than the husband. It's worth saying it's always been true in black families. And so we, we and, and that's only going to increase over time. And so we are seeing this assortative mating of matching within class happening more and more. But in some ways, I think the picture is even worse than that because you're seeing a, you know, within class marriages for the upper middle class, but you're seeing declining marriage altogether um, for uh, working class. Uh, Americans, And so it's not even that there's, there isn't just within class marriage uh, further down the ladder. There's actually less marriage overall. What are we seeing from younger generations coming up, particularly Gen Z and millennials? Are, th are they falling into the same pattern? What are we seeing there? Yeah, obviously it's, for some of these trends, it's a bit hard to know at this point um, because we're going to see have to see how it plays out. But I think some of the education gaps have really only just started to be felt in the labor market and the marriage market. So it's only relatively recently that women have tracked men in terms of earnings through, the tw through their 20s, really up to the point of having kids. And so we're seeing this playing out, I think, in the, what economists would unromantically call the marriage market. Uh, and you're seeing increasing numbers of young men 
who are struggling. And so it's striking to me that the biggest decline in employment against population has actually been among 25 to 34 year old men over the last few decades. And it's not because they're in college. It's actually not entirely clear what some of them are doing. And so I think that there's a danger that unless we act fast for some of these some of these problems that you actually have a generation that's the, the most dislocated, the most discombobulated, if you like, um, and the result of that is to reduce their incentives. And, of course, we see much higher rates of young men living at home with their parents than young women and a reduction in the number of men who say that they have close friends who are nearby them. So I'm, I'm worried about the isolation and detachment of many young men. Uh, and I, I don't have a sort of sense of moral crisis about it at this point. I think that, that's the sort of language that's overused. But I'm troubled by the fact that some of the trends affecting men, including things like mental health problems, very rapidly rising rates of suicide among young men, are going the wrong way. There does seem to be a level of despair, which, which in some cases is also being, if not weaponized, at least exploited by some. Yeah, I think that's right. There's a sense of, I think despair is true for many. We actually see deaths of despair from suicide, alcohol, or opioids. Men are at three times higher risk of that. Uh, men account for almost three out of four opioid deaths. And uh, interesting, I think those are deaths of despair, properly defined, you know, of retreat. Uh, of they're not they're not deaths that are the result of some kind of crazy risk taking behaviour. They're the results of a retreat and the, and as you suggest of of this kind of malaise that we're feeling. And so yeah, you get this growing sense of male uncertainty, male malaise, male discontent, whatever the language you want to use, it's clear that it's real. And then you've created a huge demand for someone to come along and say, yeah, I feel you. I feel your pain. And it's their fault. Them, in this case, probably being the left or progressives or the elites, uh, whatever language you want to use. And so essentially you've got all this uh, discontent uh, but that's bottled up effectively, and then someone can come along and take the take the top off the bottle. Uh, I think that's what Donald Trump did rather brilliantly. He won with the biggest gender gap in recorded polling history. I think it's what many populist movements are, are doing. You see it you know, around the world, from East Germany. Um, even Brexit was partly because of men's 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 votes, especially among young young actually young women voted for voted to stay in the European Union much more than young men did in my old country. And so, yeah, in, the, in skillful populist hands in particular, and this could be true on the left as well as the right, to be clear, this discontent can metastasize into some quite troubling political trends. And you have people like Jordan Peterson kind of exploiting that as well. Yeah, I think to be fair to Peterson, he ends up exploiting it. Um, but I think he stumbled across it, honestly. I, I, my My read of him is that he wrote some stuff and he was blown away by the demand. He wrote a Quora post. That's how this and some of it started. And and I think he tapped into this reservoir. I'm not quite sure he knew exactly what to do with it once it happened. Um, but I think what happened was he was a bit like someone who's just sort of, you know, digging around in their back, you know, back garden and hits, you know, hits a, an oil reserve. Um, <laughs> and I think he was as surprised as, you know, as anybody by the fact that his book uh, ended up selling 5 million copies and global sellout tours and so on. And I'm not saying he then lent into it and you know, made hay with it. But but I think it's more inter- what's more interesting about Peterson is not the, his, what he's been supplying. It's what the demand was. Uh, he just stumbled across it. And you see that happening over and over again. It's just like someone who's willing to just talk about this stuff, someone who's willing to listen to young men actually ends up with a massive market. And anybody that doesn't take the attention that people like Jordan Peterson have been getting seriously – isn't taking society seriously, and to dismiss all of them as just you know batshit batshit misogynists or whatever is absolutely to do a disservice to some of the real real trends that we're dealing with here. So to some extent, if there are figures that we're uncomfortable with talking about this issue, I think we need to blame ourselves rather than them, because we we as in the collective society have created the demand for those people by failing to engage constructively with what it means to be a man in today's world, a world of gender equality. If we don't talk about it, they will, and then they'll get the audiences. And finally, the flip side of that, do we need more role models, male role models, talking about this from a positive perspective? And will that make a difference? Yeah, I think it'll make a huge difference. I mean, there's one of the great slogans of the women's movement is you, you can't be it if you can't see it. And I think that 
models of like mature pro-equality masculinity are absolutely needed and of engaged fatherhood uh, absolutely needed and those can speak honestly more volumes than any number of policy papers dare i say it even out of the august brookings institution where i collect my paycheck from barack obama for example was a potent, was a hugely important role model and i think he could have done much more to talk about the issues facing young boys and men and what it meant to be a father today uh, and so I, I think that just having politicians and public figures willing to talk about these issues, willing to talk about what it means to be a man today, um, to take some pride in a mature, egalitarian form of masculinity would go a great way to start helping solve some of these problems and then create a climate within which we could actually do some policy work. But more importantly, it would send a signal to young men, which is like, this is how you can be in the world. Because if no one else is saying, as I say, they are they, as in a, me- a number of these disempowered and in some cases drifting young men, are rather desperate for someone to tell them how to be in the world. And so if it's not Barack Obama or Mitt Romney, choose another example, then it'll be Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate. Richard V. Reeves, his book is Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It. Richard, it has been a pleasure. I thank you so much for spending time with us. As always, a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.